Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Adventures in the Underland, the CQ Forensic Toolkit as a unique weapon against hackers. You are in Laguna JKL right now, and today Paula Januskovic will be delivering this talk to you. Just a couple of uh, comments before we get started. Don't forget to stop by the business hall that's located in Mandalay Bay, Oceanside, and Shoreline Ballrooms. Also, the Black Nat uh, Black Hat Arsenal is in the business hall in Oceanside. And one last reminder to make sure to silence your phones. And with that, Paula, take it away. Yeah, it's lovely. Good afternoon, everyone. How is everybody doing? Good, yes, good to hear that. Okay, so as you see, uh, I'm Paula J, and uh, just a couple of words for the introduction, and then we're gonna get immediately to the subject. We've got 50 intense minutes about forensics. So basically, I'm the CEO of Secure, so it's a company that I've established 11 years ago. We are right now in New York, uh, Dubai, Switzerland, and Poland, performing uh, penetration tests, forensic investigations, and also education. And uh, myself, even though you've got this a funky role over there, Microsoft Regional Director. You might be wondering, am I actually working for Microsoft? And I'm not. Uh, so why this is over there? It's just like, I'm not Microsoft. I'm not even a director. So am I regional then? Yes. Uh, this is actually the role of someone that Microsoft gives including actually access to the source code of Windows uh, to someone that does something innovative uh, in technology. So apparently uh, this is it. Um, but um, my background is very straightforward. I'm enjoying my uh, consultant's life. And this is basically my background, visiting customers and figuring out if it's possible to get inside. My team as well does a lot of research, so that's pretty much what this also session is going to be about. So we're going to be discussing the CQ Forensic Toolkit. Um, it's uh, different types of tools that uh, within our team, we use them for forensics. We share them with you for free, so that's very important to mention. And you are able to download them from our blog, secureacademy.com slash blog. And these are the tools that uh, eventually we figured that we need to have them because during the projects, uh, we simply needed them and this is how they were created. So we hope and I hope that this session, and this is my personal goal for today, is gonna to bring your forensics, if you're doing the one, to the next level. We're gonna be discussing today things like data protection API, because our team fully reverse engineer the whole crypto platform in Windows, and we shared lots of different tools about that. So it's gonna be about this. It's gonna be about information extraction from Windows. So this is what's gonna happen in this 50 minutes. I'm also on Twitter sharing different types of information there, so feel free to check, and uh, we are good to go. Uh, if it's about, of course, my engagements within the different types of events, and if you will be searching for more information, absolutely please do that. Uh, within our team, it's not only myself speaking from our team, you are able to find lots of different types of tools written by our team members out there. Yeah? So that would be a bit for the introduction. Let's have a look at the whole context. So before we actually start uh, the presentation, I would like to share with you uh, one of my favorite stories. And this is my favorite story because it shows different types of looks on cybersecurity that we've got. It doesn't have to be only technology, it can be also something else. And the story is related with our customer in Switzerland when I was supposed to do the social engineering project, and they are supposed to do the whole analysis that were related with it. So long story short, uh, my job was to get inside the building and steal some data, whatever that way would be, right? So I do start the project like this, that I'm like seeing the customer building, there is like the entrance, so you are able basically to uh, either like use the card teat, and the door will open, or you can type the pin, but I don't have either of those. Or you can call them, there's like this big bulby camera and they're gonna see you, which if you wanna do social engineering, this is probably the last choice that you would pick, right? So at the end, what I did, there was just this door at the very beginning to the elevator area. I stick to some nice guys back, and don't get me wrong, uh, I'm gonna be very open with you, sorry about that. Being a woman in the guys industry helps a little bit. And Blonde also adds a little bit of that. So I like to talk 
really with everybody everywhere in the elevator especially um, I like to meet people so this is very nice and the social engineering project is something that I also do in, within our team so this is a little bit of a funky combination that allows me to get inside it or get, get into different types of situations right so anyway I'm in the elevator area because I did something that we call tailgating um, just in case this guy turns back or something, I could always smile <laughs> stupidly and he's gonna believe it, right? So this is, this is the situation. Now, I'm in the elevators area, yeah? And the situation is that we've got an elevator A and B, and in between those, you've got a pod. And you are able to type, like the, the, just to press the floor number that you wanna go to. So this particular customer was spread across three floors, six, seven, and eight. So I'm waiting for someone to actually press floor six or seven, because I know that on the floor eight there was a reception and I don't want to be seen over there. So I'm leveraging a bit of a stereotype of a girl. We've got always like big bags with like lots of things inside. Again, I mean, it fits in the, into the stereotype, so I'm kind of using it. And I'm observing at the same time, is there someone pressing the floor six or seven? And there is this guy, again, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real story, so I'm, I was enjoying this project actually. Uh, so there's this guy, and he's actually quite handsome, score. So he presses the floor six, door is opening. What I'm doing, I'm jumping to the backside of the elevator quite quickly and immediately, and door closes. We are together in the elevator with this guy. And the question to you guys is, why did I jump to the backside of the elevator? What do you think? Speak out. Some suggestions. Put yourself in a... Yeah, he might not notice me, right? So I can be like, oh, I, I want to be noticed. But okay, that could be actually one of the situations, right? He might not notice me. What else? Make him look natural. Make him look? Make him look natural. Oh, so that is kind of natural? Yeah, it could be. I could be pretending that I'm, I'm supposed to be there, yeah? So a couple of other things. I could read his mobile phone and so on. Totally yes, but what happened is that when the door closed, we started this conversation, right? And the conversation was, I'm just asking you a question, how, how are you doing? And I'm smiling, you know, like, you know, that encourages people to smile back. So he smiles back and he's like, I'm fine, how are you doing? And I'm making a little bit of a posa because posa makes people to expect you some, to, that you're gonna say something. So it's like, this tension is increasing so I'm waiting and smiling and looking, and I'm saying, nice to see you again, too. <laughs> and he's like, oh, again. So basically, whenever we are thinking about the whole concept, yeah, he's feeling that we've, we've known each other before. Yeah? So at the end, whenever we are just continuing this conversation, I decided to bring the conversation to the next level, and I said, you know what, you smell very well. Yeah, it's kind of, oh, I think, right? And then he's like, uh, and then he's like, do you think so? I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Why did I do that? To make him feel good. A, sorry, this is brutal, I know, but who cares about that? It's a project to be done, right? So second part is that he wants to show off a little bit. So when we got to the, to the floor and the door opened, he took his cart, he came out first, that's why I was second in the elevator. He did the tick, he opened the door, and he sat with the lowered voice, ladies first. So I'm getting in, yeah? And my job is to steal data. So long story short, uh, what well, was quite interesting, I was just like, going around and I was wondering where am I able to sit down and get the data out of someone's computer. And because this was a financial organization, um, there was like traders floors, so team of traders, they stood up and they left the room without locking their desktop. Sounds a little boring, but I decided to steal the data, so you plug in whatever USB stick, if they're allowed, not allowed, in this case they were allowed, I copied some data, I run some code, and I'm done with my job. So later on, their job was to figure out actually what happened. And in general, my point for everything is that there are so many aspects to take into consideration when we are doing the forensic investigation, as we all know. But the question is, as well, do we have good tools to investigate what actually happened? And this is what this session is about, about all these details, interesting places, interesting ways of extracting data that will allow us to bring the investigation to the next level. Now, we're going to start 
with a very interesting tool because um, within our projects, as I mentioned, we, we do a lot of different types of analysis. Um, and that interesting tool is going to be related with extracting of the EVTX files from the memory. So we were in the need at the customer side to actually perform the memory dump, perform the disk dump, but, but we, we were wondering how and what type of information SLs is actually in the memory dump. And one of the things that our team did, it took us over six months to do it, we have reverse engineered EVTX format, so the even log format, which sounds very easy because it's like XML kind of, but eventually it's not easy because in the XML, in the EVTX format, you've got a lot of different types of chunks that are digitally signed and the big chunks are also digitally signed. So when there's small thing being changed, then the file is corrupted. So we technically wrote a tool that not only makes your files fixed, so if you get a corrupted EVTX, then we can fix it for you, and that's A and B, we are able to extract from the memory of the operating system the even log part that is not yet written into the EVTX file. So if there is an event generated, we are able to make a snapshot of it and then build a consistent EVTX file on the top of that. Let me show you, it's actually very easy to, to do. And I would like to show you that extraction on the live dump so that at the end you are able to do um, the same story uh, when you perform your memory dump. So have a look. First command that I run over here, it's th that I'm using volatility from the analyze, um, analyze DMP. Let me just change this particular file over here. Uh, so we're gonna have the analyze DMP uh, to get information um, to the DLL list dot txt and within the dll list dot txt i will be able to see as you see this is the this is the case different type of output and i already have the file um, where we are able to see uh, different types of dlls loaded within the dump why am i doing this because if i would like to extract evtx files that are managed by the event log service then event log service is actually nothing but the svc host and you got when you got a memory dump as you've got many SVC hosts. So how do you know which SVC host hosts Windows Event Log Service? By the DLL loaded in it, right? So we're gonna be searching in this particular dump the, the um, DLL that is representing our um, win, win Windows Event Log Service. So I got that thing. So I got here 848. This is the SVC host process ID. Why this is interesting for me? Because I've got over here WEVT SVC in it. So this is how you recognize appropriate Windows Event Log. Fine. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna extract the data from the handles that this particular SVC host um, is pointing to. So let's do that. And we're gonna run that by leveraging another command. So let's just, um, let's just do that. So we've got here analyze DMP profile, and then we're gonna do dump files, dump files. And we're gonna do minus N to preserve the names. We're gonna do minus process ID 848 it was. And then we're gonna do minus capital D handles uh, and folder, and this is the place where we're gonna be extracting files to which SVC host has handles to. And that's gonna be the base for us to work to extract data from EVTX files. Now these EVTX files are not consistent, all right? And this is what I would like to show you basically. So what we're gonna do over here, this is this folder, and as you see, we are getting the data in the folder, so we don't need more because it's already, it's already what we need. So what am I searching for over here? It's simply application log, and we're gonna find this, this guy. Why this one? Because it's big, and it would be nice that you guys can see that that's what we are able to recover. What is this? This is a part of an EVTX file that was actually in the operating system's memory, and that's quite cool. I'm gonna take this file, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna paste it into my um, tool over here, so that at the end, we are able to see uh, how we are able to, of course, recover this type of data. So let me show you the whole structure of the uh, demonstration, right? So I'm pasting this particular application uh, log file over here. So this is this one. Uh, I'm gonna show it in GUI because uh, at the very beginning it's gonna be a little bit more convenient. Just to show that this file does not actually open yeah, so I'm just gonna press enter on it. And in the meantime, uh, I'm gonna see on my screen, so let me just move it, that this one says that the even log file is corrupted. Yes, because 
that's pretty much how they are. They're very sensitive. So I'm gonna, just going to say, okay, fine. And I, in this folder, I've got also folder out, which is empty. And this particular folder will contain our fixed EVTX. So let's just have a look how simple our tool is at the end in order to fix this type of uh, situation. So I'm going to get into this particular tool and the tool works like this, cqevtxrecovery.exe and we specify the input folder with the broken data and we specify output folder, here we go, where the data should be stored, so in, in, out, out enter and then it tells me that it successfully recovered 17 records yeah and in this particular out folder we are able to see that this is this application file and this application file we will be able to open basically in our event lock it just takes a little bit uh, of time so it's just loading it uh, so in a moment i will show you and then eventually we'll be able to read of what was what was happening with this particular file yeah so this is our application lock that we are able to technically um, get access to here we go not this one this one here we go so here we go. So we've got here that information, meaning records because they are like chunks of data. So this, these are the events that application log contained before actually flashing them to the drive, just to make sure you don't miss out. Maybe there is something important, maybe not, but lots of files like that may contain some useful, useful information. Okay guys, so whilst we are discussing that, is there any other tool, is there any other place that could help us out to get more information about what's going on? Yeah, if someone gives you a disk for forensics, we are wondering, okay, like now stage is yours. What type of information are we going to be extracting? US and journal, of course, we're going to be getting into prefetch, which I'll show you in a moment. We're going to be getting into possibly hashes of the users, profile related information. So the list is big, but there are a couple of places that are quite unusual to search. And this is something that I would like to, I would like to show you. One of the first things that we're going to get to it's one of our favorite tools, which is related with um, extracting the passwords from these service accounts. And this is something that we're going to be getting to. If within the services, you will find out in a security hive, in the registry of that machine, that you've got some secrets in the registry hive uh, that is basically uh, security, then we get into policy, secrets, and then we are able to see uh, basically if uh, there are some secrets stored, so you can simply see that. Then our job is going to be to extract maybe some credentials of that particular user. So let me show you what do we mean by this, yeah? So, and what kind of secrets we are referring to. If we do reg edit, here we go. Uh, and we are right now in this path that I was mentioning. So we are in the uh, security hive right now and we are in a policy. And then there is this folder that is actually called secrets. I wonder what it contains. And we are able to see here that there is lots of data protection API secrets, but then there is also, or could be a secret that is related with the particular service account, yes? And what do we mean by this? So let's, let's have a look. And so this is basically the entrance. If we do have a look at the service accounts, so we get into the services MSC, yeah? and I find over here some kind of a service. So we've got a pull us service, log on, and I will just do create some kind of a secrets over here. It doesn't matter which account we are using, I'm just typing something. It could be whatever we type in over here. Fantastic. Then if we do refresh this, yeah, then basically we're gonna see over here that there is actually a secret, and this is how you recognize it, that is called PJ service. And from that secret offline, we are able to extract the password for the service accounts. So quite a straightforward operation, and we do it basically like this. So we go to the CQ secrets dumper, and then you just specify the service name, and in this case, it was a PJ service, and then you are able to see the password coming out. It might be a useful information. Yeah, so it, it is actually a tool that our customers are also using just to figure out what are the passwords for the service accounts, but it also could be used for that reason. Yeah, okay, so what else do we have? We, all, we have as well one interesting tool, and let's show it, but eventually it is actually quite a lightweight tool, which is related with extracting information from the Windows prefetch. So let's have a look, guys, like how this particular tool will work out. So if we have a look at the operating system in Windows, we've got something like prefetch. 
prefetch, when it's on, contains information about whatever executed in our box. Yeah, so it gathers history about whatever was executed. So if you did not delete it, it will contain the whole history since you pretty much installed Windows. You are able to see over here that you had certain type of executable that executed that many times at that time and it contained different types of DLLs loaded. Let me show you basically how we are able to extract information from this PF files and actually make it useful. So when you wondered, how do I know that our infrastructure has been compromised. Let's have a look at the prefetch. Could hacker delete a prefetch? Of course, there could be always some kind of a, a fun done around all this evidence. Uh, EVT, EVTX though, it's very hard to play with. You can always delete it though. But prefetch is quite straightforward uh, to edit, but hopefully this wasn't changed, which maybe you can change in a, check in a USN journal too. Let's have a look at one executable. Let's, that could be this. And I'm gonna do uh, over here, uh, shift, right click, and then we're gonna do copy as path. And within our toolkit, we've got a simple tool, which is called CQ Prefetch Parser, that I'm pretty sure you guys might enjoy it, because the only thing we specify over here, it's the minus F file, and then we do minus A for analysis, and this shows us fully, not only the list of the modules, so DLLs and some other files loaded in that, in that process, but also how many times someone has been running it. So in this case, you're able to see that it has been 68 times, plus these are the times that this file has been uh, actually running. So it's quite nice because it shows you the history of particular executables in operating system. Now, this is fun, but um, at the end, what if, for example, we're gonna have run count one? And this is what we are looking for. So it could be called notepad, which by name, because it doesn't have a digital signature, it doesn't sound very juicy, but if you uh, see that run count for notepad is one, that's already suspicious, and you might have a look further, maybe in Windows indexing service, maybe in USN journal, maybe in a cache of compatibility, and a couple of other places, if this file has been actually there, what does it do, etc. So quite an interesting perspective. Now, whenever we are thinking about all this data, the prefetch is quite popular, but is there something unusual that can contain useful information that might be, um, might be containing something that could indicate that something happened in this box? Yes, one of the interesting things that we've been looking at is actually related with extracting uh, data from the remote desktop cache. And in order to extract data from the remote desktop cache, what you need to do is to get first the uh, cache file, of course, and then um, have a tool that will allow you to work on this particular cache file. And that is something that uh, we've written. Probably this is the most ugly tool that you will ever see from us because uh, the GUI is literally non-existent and the tool itself is actually quite, uh, quite funny. But uh, what is the beauty of the tool is that remote desktop um, in general, it's a, it's a protocol that is relying on the grid. So when you connect, for example, uh, remotely to uh, the server uh, using the RDP, you download the different grids and you kind of stuck it on the top of the cache file. And this is something that I would like to show you guys. So what do we do uh, to get this particular cache? So let's have a look. Our tool's name, if we have a look over here, it's called actually uh, CQRD cache. And within the CQRD cache, you are able to uh, load not this one. This is for hiding files. We've got this one. And we just do load. And over here, I'm loading the cache from sample user administrator update a local Microsoft terminal server client cache. We do open. Here we go. And we can do the code. Now, depending on the remote desktop client's version, that grid might have a different size. So this one, we are specifying on 32, so it's gonna be a 64 uh, size. And then we do the code, and that looks a little bit better. And the question to you guys is, what did someone see? What is this? Yeah, it is, well, it's not a snapshot, it's like the grid that we have stuck in. But of course, it's not a puzzle, it's just, so you cannot build logic on the top of that because it's just stuck. So if someone moves window around within RDP, it's gonna be just like, in this weird way, putting the grid 
the, the squares on the top of the log file. So what did someone see? What is this, what is this console about? IIS, exactly, thank you, yeah? So we were able to see that someone could see IIS. And this file is big, so you can move in, in kind of snapshots yeah, in the file to observe how, what was actually happening within the remote desktop session. So this is a whole history of ever happens, whatever happens within the remote desktop session. Yeah, so it's somewhat like recording, but you were able to see that by the square little pictures, yeah? So a little bit of that. Now, whenever we are thinking, of course, about different types of files being deleted, because maybe someone could delete this file, is it possible in an easy way to recover files? Yes, we actually got a tool that is called CQ and delete that I would like to show you um, because um, there's a couple of ways how we're able to delete the files. But the funky part about the tool is that with the super easy perspective, it allows us to recover files also from the MFT. And small files up to approximately 700 bytes when you delete them, and even though when you do it with shift, and even though when you overwrite the disk, they will be still stored in a clear text in MFT. And our tool allows you to recover that kind of data. Yeah? So this is basically what I would like to show you. So let's have a look at the, at the, at the situation. right? So I've got over here a certain, certain uh, type of a partition. So let me just mount it within the PowerShell so that you can see that we are doing it in a fresh way. So this is it. So we've got a certain path. We are mounting the partition. Here we go. And then this is our X drive over here. So let me take this. And what we're going to do over here uh, in the moment, so this is also our PowerShell case, I'm going to create on this particular partition lots of different types of files. Uh, that uh, eventually I'm going to delete. Yeah. So this is the uh, this is the demonstration. Let me just pull it out. Yes. So I have created these files. So we're going to wipe me, wipe me, wipe me. So what I'm going to do? Shift right click. So I'm just going to select all these files. Shift right click, and we're going to do delete. Fantastic. Yes, we got it. So files are deleted. What else I'm going to do? I'm going to overwrite. Yeah. Here, um, that particular partition. So just to make sure the data is in there, etc. And then with our tool, I'm going to list all the possibilities of what eventually we are able to recover. So even though this data has been deleted and overwritten, we are still able to do a little bit more about, about um, that, that uh, recovery. And basically, when we have a look at the whole concept, is it possible to recover a file? I've got here another command with the CQ undelete or from the volume X, when we are undeleting the file that is called wipe me 8 txt, and we are doing the output into the wipe me 8 txt. Let's have a look. Uh, I got a file already like this because I've been practicing before the demonstration, so let's delete it, which will be even better because we'll be able to see that it actually uh, worked out. Here we go. Or we can change the output name, that's fine too. Here we go. And then our wipe me txt is actually the file that contains the certain type of a content. Yeah. So very easy way to undelete files, not only the ones that are stored inside the MFT, but also the file that has been just deleted. Yeah? So um, quite an easy tool, but very, very handy, especially even for your private use when you are deleting the file that uh, you would like to get access to back. OK, fantastic. So what else is interesting? Now we're going to get into the subject that is absolutely exciting because uh, there are plenty of places that contain information, but what is the most difficult part out of that, it's a data protection API. And our team has fully reversed uh, data protection API, so full crypto platform in Windows. And we've got all of the different types of tools, over actually 40 tools that are cooperating with data protection API forensically to give you the data back. So what I would like to present to you today it's an interesting scenario where our job is going to be to get access to the information that is stored by the user in an encrypted way. And our job is going to be to decrypt it and get access to the user's secrets. So which scenario does this apply to? All of the scenarios where user is storing password in the browser, storing password in Outlook, storing private keys, 
storing, for example, passwords in KeePass, if the KeePass is relying on the Data Protection API, Remote Desktop Connection Manager, and any other, literally, application that uses Data Protection API, and there's a plenty of those. So let's have a look, because this scenario is not only important forensically, but it's also important for ourselves. If you ever wondered, if I do store some kind of a secret in my laptop, is it safe? And let's answer that question if you don't mind. So what we're going to do, here we got a user that is actually um, Windows 10. Let's just use that. And I'm going to log on to the Windows 10 box. Let's have a look. As Freddy. And bring it on. We're going to log on as Freddy using the password password. Yeah, I'm showing you this because it's going to be quite important information. Let's do that. So we got it. We can just minimize it. I have no access to the internet with this machine. There is no vulnerability that we are overusing over here. That's how it works, and this is how it has been working for all time. Our team has reverse engineered so that we are able to decrypt everything that moves, pretty much that belongs to the user. Let's see. This is called Data Protection API Classic, what we're going to pre be presenting, because an alternative for that, it's a Data Protection API NG, which we can also touch the base on while we are, for example, trying to recover um, the SIT protected PFX files which are uh, available since Windows Server 2012 R2. So let's have a look. So we've got the following situation. Yeah, let's go to the scenario first. We've got Freddy. Freddy, being a user, uh, stored passwords in Chrome. Yeah, we may disagree if it's good or bad. It doesn't matter because Chrome is also leveraging DP API, and this is a data protection API secrets of the user bank. What do we see over here? And I'm using the nearest of tool Chrome Pass for that, and that's okay. Is a password password? Yeah. So this is a password stored in a browser, not a rocket science. Now, what our job is going to be is to get access to this password, but as an outsider. And let me explain first, if you don't mind, how Data Protection API works in order to basically get this particular data out. First of all, Data Protection API in general allows us to encrypt data in Windows, and that's a fact. Now, it is used by many, many different types of applications in a different way, and in order to be able to get access to the Data Protection API secrets, you have to do it in two ways. And one way, it's a, if you are a local user, and another way, if you are in a, as a domain user. Now, this might not be super clearly readable, but absolutely have a look. But I would like to use my artistic skills so that you can guys see by the picture, and I'm going to paint with my finger, uh, what is the difference in between local user and the domain user. Let's do that. Here we go. So, story goes like this. We've got over here local user, and we've got over here domain user. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm going to be obvious for the moment, just for the purpose of explanation of this. Uh, we've got a user that logs on with the username and the password. And if it's a local user, of course, we are calculating MD4 on the top of that, which we compare with the SAM database. This is clear. Now, here's the funky part. Password, we are calculating on the top of the password SHUA1. And that SHUA1 is used to encrypt master key that we store in the master key container, and that master key indirectly, but still, this is quite a linear situation, is used to encrypt or decrypt our secret. Our secret, let's say, could be Chrome password or Outlook password, doesn't really matter. So we can easily get into the conclusion that our secrets, if we are a local user, are as safe as our password strength is. Yeah, so that's it because Data Protection API being a good mechanism, um, in this case, relies on our password strength. Yeah? Now, whenever we are thinking about the domain user, though, let's change the uh, perspective here. It is working in an interesting way because we've got over here a username and the password. And I'm going to shorten, of course, the whole authentication process because it's not important right now. So when the user logs on, we've got, of course, calculated MD four on the top of that, eventually we authenticate to the domain. And that MD4, so there is a difference, it's used to encrypt master key one from the master key container that is used to encrypt the secret. That's fine, but what else is new over here? So master key two 
It's something that we call, uh, in general, uh, the key that is used within the domain. And the master key too, it's the same. They're equal, that is also used to encrypt the secret, but master key too, it's encrypted by the public key of the domain. Here we go. So master key one by our password hash, master key two by the public key of the domain. What is the question that we need to ask over here in order to get access to the master key two? Where is the private key? Who stores the private key? And the, there's good news and bad news. Well, actually both news are bad, but eventually one is better than the other. So bad news is that there is only one public key across the whole domain. So if you are working in a 100,000 people company, public key is encrypting master key too for every single user being a domain member. What does it mean? It means that whoever has access to the private key is actually able to eventually uh, decrypt all of the people's secrets stored in their profiles. So being that person, it's a bit of a powerful role, isn't it? So let's play this role for the moment to learn what our toolkit can help you with, but at the same time, it could be also uh, dangerous, depends on who, who is actually using it. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna do this scenario like that. So I'm gonna be back to the Windows 10 client box, and in order to keep this demo linear, I'm gonna allow myself to use offline access just to keep it straight. But we can do it both online and offline to edit different types of data that I'm gonna be editing over here. So I'm just gonna do it like this because it's quite straightforward. So let me restart this box, because what we're gonna do we're gonna overwrite cache logon data, so something that people call cache credentials, but they have nothing to do with credentials. Uh, and we're gonna log on to this box with a different password, so that we've got a different password hash, so that first you guys can see that if we are using a different password, we are not able to get access to the user's data, and that's positive. But of course, we would not be on a black hat if it ended up like that. So let's continue this scenario with something a little bit more dramatic. So let's overwrite cache log on data first. We're gonna go repair your computer. Um, here we go. And then we're gonna get into a scenario where we're gonna do troubleshoot, command prompt, and then we've got our command prompt. Let me just quickly increase the font so that the guys in the back can see too. Bang. And uh, let's get into uh, CQ tools over here. And let's get into the Kiwi Secure Edition. And let's go to the Nimi cuts of the Benjamin sitting over here. There we go. Uh, but uh, this is our Secure Edition as well. So if you drop it to the virus total, it's not recognized by antivirus, by the way. And we're gonna do it like this. LSA dump, cache. And we are overriding cache log on data. So we do D. Windows, system32, config, and we are right now, system, overriding a cache log on data so that we can log on with a different password, uh, eventually different passwords hash, so that we will try to get access to our secrets stored in Chrome, but we won't be able to. Well, let's have a look. So we've got a system32, and then we're gonna do security, and then we're gonna do Kiwi to override cache log on data, bang, now every, let's see what we got, system32, oh my bad, uh, config, of course this is what's missing, so I made a small typo in a command, but let's correct ourselves, it's not security, but it's uh, still config, and then we've got security, that works. Fantastic, now in order to be able to log on with the cache logon data, what we need to do is to disconnect ourselves from the network, so this is also a simulation of a forensic activity when someone gives you the drive, and you are supposed to analyze that data offline. So let's take this off, and right now, I'm on the client machine, I'm not booting it from any CD, DVD, we're just gonna log on as Freddy, but we're gonna log on with a different password by knowing how cache logon data works. And the cache logon data, 
allows us eventually to log on to this particular box with a different password. Uh, just for the reference, if someone is interested what we actually did underneath, we have overwritten cache logon data by leveraging uh, the knowledge about the Microsoft's implementation of the MSDC2, where you were actually using the function pbkdf2 that takes a bunch of parameters. Yes, one is a hmax schwa1, so let's say somewhat random value. DCC1, which is nothing but a username, stick to users' passwords hash. So username md4, so passwords hash, and on the top of that we calculate md4, and that is what DCC1 is. And then we've got a username, 10,240 iterations on the 16 blocks. So this is what the cache log on data was. We didn't break it, we just overwritten it. That's it. So once we are on our client box again, I'll try to log on with the password password. Here we go. And bang, as you see, does not work out. And our password is going to be this time Mimigats. So let's just do enter. And then basically we are able to log on to the Freddy Krueger's box. Let's have a look uh, immediately into the CQ tools if we're able to get access to this Chrome pass. And we are firing up this right now in order to see if we are able to get access to that user secret. And that takes time. Why? Because we are using master keys. We are trying to decrypt master keys with the current passwords hash. And we cannot do that. And unfortunately that takes time. But eventually we can see that Unfortunately, we we're not able to get access to the user's passwords because the current password's hash did not decrypt master key one, right? Okay, let's start fun. So I would like to get access to the secret. What's more, I would like to get access to the secret of every single person working in this company. So what do I do? So I do the following. First of all, yeah, I have no access to, this in, to the internet here, so let's just take it out. First of all, what we do, we get into a DC, this is the guy, where we extract the, something that our team has called a gold certificate or master certificate. That particular certificate is actually stored in the uh, ntds.did and you are not able to find it in the regular certificate store of the server. And that particular certificate, in order to be extracted, and let's have a look at this one, um, we need to have appropriate tool for that. So we've got a CQ Elsa secrets damper, and CQ Elsa secrets damper allows us to specify simply as a parameter a file, and we do exported PFX, where we are able to get this private key out. Now. Who can get access to this key? Anybody who is a domain admin. Okay, so it could be a case of a domain admin that you don't trust, that basically extract that. It could be also extracted in, a, in an attack, but that's a different story. And anybody who has privilege of replicating directory changes all. And that is quite interesting because uh, in, the, in the time of a SharePoint 2003, there was actually a book release that contained a mistake which was recommending administrators of SharePoint for the, for the profile replication um, accounts to give this particular privilege. So that eventually SharePoint accounts, even they could be at regular domain users, this is something that I'm personally looking for in the infrastructure to verify if I'm able from this particular account to replicate the data to myself. Yeah? Now, all these attacks, DC sync, DC shadow, DC shadow, and so on, they also allow, are allowing us to get this particular key. So let's get uh, to see what this key is about. Exported PFX, next, next. And next, and here, it asks you to provide the password. Password is secure, so our team's name. And then we move forward. And then if we do have a look here, and if we do cert mgr.msc, we are able to see in personal certificates and this, that we've got a certificate that is very useful for someone who is about to recover data from the user's profiles. But it's kind of funny too, because we've got issued to nobody, issued to by, by nobody. It's only valid for a year. So if you, for example, change your domain, upgrade, or if you do whatever, that certificate does not get renewed. When you get a Kerberos ticket, you can reset them every night, but not that certificate. And that's a bit of a problem. 
So technically, if you had set up your domain in 2003, and even though you did a bunch of upgrades, this certificate is dated to down to 2003. And what's kind of funny is that if you have a look at the parameters of that certificate, just to be absolutely fair, yeah, this is uh, this is a 2048 breed ski that is used over there, including Shua One, which is kind of sad, but that's the reality. So you like it or not, that's the fact. So that certificate, each of you have. Now, that certificate can be used by someone, and I would like to show you how, in order to get access to the uh, user's personal data. Let's start this process. So right now, I'm back on the client machine, and I'm going to start up a comment prompt. As a regular user, we don't, need any be, uh, we don't need any particular privileges here. And in order to be able to learn which master key is actually used for Chrome, I'm going to use one forensic tool that we've written. But first, let me give you a little bit of a background so that we all are on the same page in the Data Protection API. So master keys are stored for everybody in the same folder. They are stored in the Freddy, in the users, Freddy's um, folder. We've got Updata, Roaming. We've got Microsoft. And then we've got Protect. And then we've got Sid. And then we've got master keys stored over here. Now, which of those is used for Chrome? I have no idea, but we know how to check. OK, so how do we check for that? And this is, by the way, my literally favorite tool that we got because it shows you a lot forensically. I love it. Let me show you. So here we go. We got it like this. If we get into the CQ tools, we've got a tool, DP API, that is called CQ DP API blob searcher. And CQDP API blob searcher, it's just a simple, though very useful, searcher across the data protection API blobs. So if you ever wondered, do I have any secrets in my laptop that I, that I don't know about that are DP API, that tool will tell you this, and you can always maybe delete that, yeah? So here we go. We've got parameters, minus F, minus R, that I'm going to minus D for folder, minus R, minus O. So let's use this, yes, as simple as it could be. So we've got a minus D where the Chrome data is stored. In the users, Freddy, Updata, Local, here we go. And then we've got Google, and then we've got Chrome, bang. And we've got uh, another one, which is R for recursive. And then we've got O for output, where we specify our CQ tools, and that's it. And I'm going to stream the output into DP, TXT. It's going to take a couple of seconds. And I'm looking in the Google Chrome folder for all the identifiers of the data protection API blobs so that I can get the master key out so that I can decrypt the user's secret. Let's have a look. We've got a DP, TXT. It's a little small, but let me enlarge it. And I already see the key that we are interested in. Bring it on. That's this B55, yeah? And we can see that this identifier, master key GUID, it's actually the one that is used by Chrome, including using SHUA1 and triple desk. That's a different story, yeah? OK, let's move forward. So we've got B55. Nice, good to know. So I'm, let me minimize that. And I'm going to go over here to this folder to search for B55. And I found it. That's this guy. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to work on it. Shift, right click, copy as path. Lovely. So let's get into the console. First of all, what I'm going to do here is to generate my current passwords hash. And my current password is Mimikatz. And my current passwords hash will be used to encrypt back master key so that I can use it live. All right, we're going to decrypt it with the PFX and encrypt it back with our current passwords hash. Simple operation. So let's do that. We're going to be using for that CQ, another tool, master key AD. Absolutely nice tool that allows us to specify master key that we are working on, PFX that we've got from the domain, and then new hash that we are actually getting from this simple calculation over here. Let's get that. Here we go, enter. And then we've got over here created a new key, AD modified. This one, AD modified, is encrypted with our current password hash. So this guy, we can name good because eventually we did not have access to it. But this one, we should have access to it because we have decrypted it with the PFX and encrypted with the current password hash. There's one more thing, guys, that I have to do. I have to use the attrib command 
to actually set it to system and hidden bank. And eventually, what we're getting over here, F5, it's the password of the user. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. So basically, this is something that you can do to 100,000 people that might be working for you because there's only one key that everything relies on. And can you tell that your users in the company are not storing passwords in a browser? And if you say no, then there is still Outlook, there is still private key, there are still applications. So all the different types of secret that we got like this. Now, cherry on the top is, if you've got any type of other type of data like this, like for example, it could be it could be things like key pass and so on. What I would like to show you is that eventually you are able to pull any type of application and if it uses data protection API as well, you are able to get access to these types of secrets too. So once we've got this reversed, uh, then you are able to uh, move forward and eventually uh, decrypt that type of data. So please have a look. What I'm going to do here so here I've got the following situation. I've got key pass. We can just close the, the key pass um, from here. Here we go. Let's do it. And I got the following key pass here. Yeah. So this is basically what we're going to be getting to. I'm going to delete this file. So we've got a CQ base. And this is the file that if I do type secure over here, which is the password that uh, we are using, and I do OK, this password doesn't work. Right? So funny part, we would like to get access to the key pass. So what do we do? When we were decrypting this master key of the user, we are also able with our toolkit to put it in a clear text. Eventually it has to be in a clear text to be encrypted back with our password hash. So what I'm doing over here, have a look, I'm actually using the entropy of the key pass, which is the same for all the key pass. Then I'm using blob that I'm gonna be working on. So this is for the key pass protected user key bin. So it's a file that is actually protecting the key pass database. And then I'm using the master key, which you can extract, as we mentioned, from basically our toolkit. So that this is this master key that we've been talking about. So master key one, for example. So once we got that, we're able to get the key over here that is purely used to decrypt the key pass database. Have a look, guys. That's going to be super quick demonstration. Our toolkit over here, which has a lovely name of a CQDP API key pass DB decryptor, so easy to remember, right? Um, has two values, K and F. Let's clear it out and let's use it. So we're going to be using K, and that's this key that I have decrypted, and we're going to be using F for C analysis CQ base that we could not get access to. Enter. What it says, successfully save re-encrypted file to the CQ base. Uh, let's have a look. So that's basically this file here. And I'm going to open it up, double click. Let's just close this key pass that we got. There we go. And then this guy comes to place. We are this time specif specifying the password secure because by re-encrypting it, we are able to do that. And then OK, and this is how you manage to get access to the key pass database. So, so that's what you got when you are able to reverse data protection API. And within our team, we're providing full toolkit to decrypt data, data protection API secrets that you guys might find during your forensic investigation. That's what I mean by bringing forensic investigation to the next level. You're working with a data blobs that you can identify as a DP API secret, and then, then what's what? next? And this is exactly what we are referring to. So this is a toolkit that is related to the DP API, major toolkit. There is much, much more than that. And this is also part of our forensic toolkits that you guys may want to have a look at. So as you see, and let's get into the summary, we were able to decrypt different types of data by leveraging our toolkits. Hopefully you guys will be able to download it. We are sharing all the tools and knowledge for free. So we've got a CQ.RE forensic toolkit. So make sure that you will not miss out um, after the black hat. And at the end, um, of course, I would like to invite you to our team squeeze. Our team is uh, absolutely loving to know more. And if you want to know more, there's no registration over here. This is the quiz when you learn. So you answer questions. And if you answer wrongly, we tell 
tell you immediately what's wrong. This is a cybersecurity quiz, our 4.0 release that uh, we release pretty much every year uh, for everybody that likes cybersecurity. If you want to have more information, of course, at the end, um, we've got our um, blog and this is a secureacademy.com, which you can see on the right side, where we also share the tools and this presentation. Thank you so much for coming. I hope it was useful for you.